Hi, I'm Emily Jones. I'm an associate professor at the Bravatnik School of Government, and we're hosting a series of reflections on COVID-19 public policy responses around the world. I'm delighted to be joined today by David Lubin. David is Managing Director and Head of Emerging Markets Economics at Citibank. David, welcome. Thank you. Great to have you with us. So you've been watching financial markets very closely and really thinking through how this crisis is affecting emerging economies and developing countries. Could you just talk us through what exactly is happening and how this is affecting countries around the world? Okay, so there's kind of two sudden stops that that developing countries are facing. One is a sudden stop in global economic activity. That is unprecedentedly bad, as you know, it's the worst global recession since the 1930s. There's also a sudden stop in capital flows. Um, And if there's any good news uh, in this crisis, it's that the sudden stop in capital flows is not quite as bad as the sudden stop in economic activity. And then that kind of raises the question, why why has risk appetite returned? Why, Why aren't people just continuing to sell the South African Rand or the Brazilian Real or the Indonesian Rupiah, why aren't these currencies or these bond prices continuing to collapse? The first most important reason is the huge amount of policy activism on the part of the Fed uh, and other core country central banks. When real interest rates uh, become very negative in the developed world, historically that tends to push capital towards emerging markets um, and the the injections of liquidity by supporting asset prices in the US and in the Eurozone and and uh, and in Japan, by supporting asset prices in core countries, that has kind of positive spillover effects uh, on risk appetite towards developing countries. So policy activism by the Fed and, and other core country central banks is the first reason why the capital flow story is not catastrophic. But there are a couple of other kind of interesting reasons. Um, One is that because the economic consequences of this crisis are so awful, there's a collapse in domestic demand. And that collapse in domestic demand tends to reduce uh, the current account deficit of, of an emerging economy. As the current account deficit goes down because imports have collapsed, that means that the whole economy's need for foreign exchange has declined. And so that tends to kind of stabilize the the balance of payments. It stabilizes the capital account, and therefore that sort of puts a a ceiling on the endless rise in in the exchange rate. Um, So it's not a very pleasant reason why capital flows have stabilized, but you know, arithmetically, it helps to kind of stabilize things. Can you just explain to us why capital left in the first place? So we're back in March when this the pandemic really started to take hold, we saw these sudden exit of capital from emerging economies. And it's interesting you say interventions by the Fed and others have sort of stemmed, stemmed it, but why was it leaving in the first place? Um, the, the straightforward answer is risk aversion. In other words, you, you, you get to a point where uh, there's a, a huge injection of uncertainty about global growth, about global policy making, about balance sheets, something that we're going to have to come back and talk to talk about in a lot more detail. Uh, and the arrival of COVID-19 injected just a huge amount of uncertainty, a huge amount of uncertainty about, about all of those variables. And that uncertainty reduces risk appetite. Mm. And that's why, you know, the S&P fell. That's why um, uh, bond prices for American companies collapsed. Um, And when you have uh, a decline in risk appetite in the United States, that creates very negative, or or in in developed countries, that creates a a negative spillover uh, towards risk appetite in emerging economies. Yeah, that's very helpful. And so am I right in thinking that and please correct me if I'm wrong here, but on the initial outflows, there were concerns that this was even, they were even sharper than we saw yes. in the financial crisis. And that, that's, that's absolutely right. It's interesting. I mean, in the first several weeks of the crisis, up until late March, it looked to me like what I said earlier was not true. You know, what I said, what I was saying earlier was that, you know, the capital flow story is not unprecedentedly bad, but the economic story is unprecedentedly bad. Four weeks ago, well, no, maybe six weeks ago, 
it looked like the capital flow story was also unprecedentedly bad. And thank goodness that's been stabilized. Um, and by, oh, and actually maybe, maybe I should go back into, because there are a couple of other things that I wanted to mention. This is a bit of a, a nerdy economics-y point that I want to make, but it's actually very interesting. And it has to do with some of the consequences of the fact that inflation is very low these days globally and inflation expectations are collapsing across the world and, and particularly across developing countries because a demand is collapsing and also you know imagine you're an oil you're an oil importing country the oil price has gone from 60 dollars mm. a barrel to 20 something um, the decline in oil prices is hugely disinflationary for almost everyone and has knock-on effects on other prices you know the price of food is very closely connected to the price of oil because energy is an important input to the making of food. So this is a hugely disinflationary crisis at a time when inflation is low anyway. And the point that I wanna make is that 10 or 20 years ago, if a currency weakened in nominal terms, let's say you know the, the, the South African rand went from nine rand per dollar to 18 rand per dollar. In the old days, the market market participants were unsure how to interpret that because the risk was always that the the competitiveness gains of a weakening currency would be gobbled up by inflation mm. it, in economics terms it's the difference between a nominal change in the exchange rate and a real change a real mean inflation adjusted change but these days because inflation is so low it's much more likely that let's say a 10% nominal depreciation of a country's currency is more or less equivalent to a 10% real depreciation of that currency because inflation is not accelerating to yeah. gobble up yeah. in this case. And so the, the exchange rate adjustment mechanism, which is one of the things that you know, countries rely on in a crisis like this to allow, uh, to allow their economy to kind of reflect the new equilibrium um, that's in the, the global environment. The exchange rate adjustment mechanism these days is much more efficient. So it's working more because of low inflation than it than it ever used to be. Then that boosts exports. That well, no. Then we've got global well, demand shocks that mean that exports. Yeah, I mean, the idea that a weaker exchange rate will boost exports under almost any circumstances is a weak is a weak idea. The um, uh, the sort of general conclusion of the economic literature is that. Ex export growth is not that sensitive to uh, um, to to currency movements, and that's particularly true these days because nobody's buying anything. So, however cheap your currency is, it doesn't really matter. Um, but uh, but the what when I what I really am thinking about when I talk about the efficiency of the exchange rate adjustment mechanism is that if a currency has lost enough value to reflect the changed global environment, it's more likely that there will be investors wanting to buy that currency. And so capital inflows uh, become, uh, you know, become more available. And that's very helpful for a country that needs to finance its budget deficit. Fascinating. Or finance its trade deficit. Yeah. Okay, so then to sum up where we've got to so far, we had this initial outflow with the sort of risk aversion that happened. Yeah. That's been then temp tempered by the inter activism of the Fed and others putting liquidity into the system. Um, it's also been tempered by we haven't had this sort of surge in inflation that we might have expected yeah. um, to the efficiency of the exchange rate adjustment. So yeah. that gives us a picture there where developing countries are not facing the magnitude of outflow that we might have expected. So what they are seeing is a slowdown in the other sectors, of the economy, the demand shock because they're not able to then have the sort of exports. Yeah. And I think one of the consequences of a low inflation and b the stabilization in capital flows that we've seen is that it's extremely helpful or it removes an obstacle that central banks in developing countries might otherwise face. What I'm trying to get at is that in a crisis like this, in, in a devastating economic crisis that has this awful humanitarian dimension, the overwhelming obligation of a central bank in pretty much any country, but particularly in the developing country, is to make sure that interest rates are coming down. Mm. You need to reduce interest rates, not just in nominal terms, but also in real terms, in inflation-adjusted terms, in order so that the central bank can 
avoid damaging domestic balance sheets, you know, the balance sheets of companies domestically, the balance, the balance sheets of households domestically, you know, come, come, you know, families that have uh, household debt. As interest rates come down, that eases the burden on, on, on these balance sheets. Now, that could have been a problem mm. because sometimes a central, the, the monetary policy that a central bank wants to conduct to meet a domestic objective can be in can kind of conflict with the central bank that, that with with a monetary policy that a central bank needs to implement for an external objective. Right. The domestic objective is to support domestic uh, support domestic balance sheets in this catastrophic economic collapse. But imagine there was a situation where capital was flying out of of the window of these countries. In that in that environment, what a central bank might need to do, and we've seen this plenty of times in the past, is to raise interest rates to try in, and order to, in order to make owning your currency more attractive. Yeah. And, and it would have been awful. Well, this, this dilemma, yeah. this dilemma that I'm describing still exists in, in certain cases, but it, it's no way as bad as it might have been. Can you talk a um, little bit through? I mean, we've seen and it's re reassuring that it's not as bad as it might have been there. And I've seen some headlines that governments are worried about um, spending too much because they're going to get downgraded. So this is more on the sort of fiscal side, but that yes. investors will punish them and there'll be a sovereign ratings downgrade if they spend too much. And I've heard that with reference to India and other countries. Yes. Um, so the, it's, it's reassuring in a way that we don't have to worry about it so much on the capital outflows. Um, but what about the risk of sovereign rating downgrade? Is that a real risk for countries? Oh, it's a it's a huge risk. Um, you're right. You know, there are you know countries divide up. I mean, emerging economies divide up between you know countries that have uh, announced relatively generous uh, social provision in the context of this crisis. Um, Brazil, Brazil, for example, or Indonesia, and countries like India and Mexico, uh, on the other hand, who have been whose fiscal policy response to this crisis is pretty stingy. Um, to be honest, regardless of what your policy response is, the risk of sovereign downgrade is uh, really, really significant because the consequences of this crisis for debt burdens globally, not just in developing countries, but globally, are just awful. Um, the IMF published its fiscal monitor uh, last month in April, and according to the IMF, the median increase in the emerging economies debt GDP public sector debt GDP ratio will be nine percentage points. Wow. Um, so you know, going from an average of something like fifty-five percent of GDP to something like an average of sixty-four percent of GDP. Uh, these are astonishing uh, increases in public debt, and they come against the background where public debt burdens have been rising in any case. Uh, since 2008, because of the, the economic consequences of the Lehman crisis, and also particularly since 2012, when uh, the commodity boom ended, and that's you know delivered a negative shock along with lots of other negative shocks that have been sort of in the mix of the global economic environment facing developing countries since then. But basically, the point is that the last 10 years have not been particularly friendly in terms of the external economic environment that. That a developing country is confronted with and that's why uh, for all sorts of reasons and that's why debt burdens have already been rising very sharply uh, this crisis just kind of accelerates that problem uh, very very dramatically and the risk of downgrades is is a very serious problem and in a way the last thing the, the most important question on the other side of the of the health crisis Mm. is how are investors, both domestic investors and foreign investors, how are investors going to interpret these huge balance sheet deteriorations mm. in developing countries? One way of answering that question is to say, well, will they, will they have a reason to think that these increases in, in the debt GDP ratio are just temporary? If, you know, if if these were just temporary uh, shocks, 
then maybe investors might see through them and not worry about them too much. However, I don't think there's a good case for optimism on this point, partly because when I look at just, you know, if you look sweepingly at the history of public debt burdens in, in developing countries, the only time in, in recent decades where you can see a meaningful decline in debt GDP ratios is between the years 2002 and 2007, which was a global economic boom. Yeah. So if you can come up with an argument that there's going to be a global economic boom on the other side of this crisis, I'd love to hear it. But it's I, personally, I find it very difficult to be optimistic on, on that front. Wow. So let's just, can we sort of then think through for policymakers sitting in ministries of finance, central banks in a developing country that was already facing debt problems, perhaps now is an oil exporter has been hit by the fall in oil prices. Um, they're now needing to put, roll out a social safety net for vulnerable people. They're having to bail out firms what are the kind of trade-offs that they're having to weigh up? Because on one hand, there's a fear, I guess, of being punished by a sovereign downgrade. Yeah. On the other hand, there's this desperate need to just increase spending um, to adjust to the virus. So how, how to weigh this up? Um, I think that's a, it's a very, very good question. And like most good questions, very difficult to answer. <laughs> um, I think that the approach should be weighted towards addressing the humanitarian crisis. In other words, you can't, I think it's a mistake. I think what Mexico have done, has, has done, what India has done is arguably a mistake. Mm -hmm. In other words, if your if you're fiscal, I mean, partly because if your fiscal response to the crisis, in other words, if you, if you don't increase spending by much in response to the crisis, not only are you failing in a humanitarian objective, but you may also be failing in, an, in a kind of economic sense, in the sense that one of the, one of the functions of increasing public spending at the moment is to preserve the, the kind of infrastructure of a recovery, to make sure that labor markets don't completely collapse, to make sure that firms are able to keep furloughed staff rather than to have to begin afresh on the other side of this crisis. So in a way, the, arguably, the more money you spend now, the, the, the better able you are to limit the damage uh, permanently. It's a tough trade-off for governments to make, though. So there's a sort of spend now, keep the economy in a position that it's able to rebound, to recover, and then you're able to service the debt. Yeah. At the same time, there's a concern that the, the, the greater the debt burden, the greater the risk of a sovereign downgrade, the greater the interest rate is that then you're going to have to pay on that debt. So the really complicated trade-offs that governments Yes, yes. Make. I mean, I think sometimes... I mean, my, you know, very kind of basic hunch is that the, the risks of sovereign downgrades are uh, obviously serious risks. But, the, you know, the point is that the entire world has been losing creditworthiness over the last 10 years. And it's not just emerging economies, but developed countries that are also losing creditworthiness. In fact, you know, one point worth making is that although, as I said, the public debt GDP ratio in the developing world is going up by nine percentage points this year, according to that same IMF fiscal monitor, the public debt burden in the developed world is going up by uh, 12 percentage points mm. from a much higher base. So you can say, well, maybe there's a kind of ugly contest where although the increase the deterioration of emerging markets balance sheets is kind of scary. Well, the deterioration of developed countries balance sheets is even scarier. Right. And actually that might have, that might contain a kind of seed of some good news for emerging economies because the bigger the debt burden in the developed world, the more it is absolutely necessary for those countries, for the US, for the UK and others, to keep real interest rates very, very low. Mm. And as long as those real interest rates are kept very, very low and negative, that, as I said earlier, tends to help push capital towards emerging economies. So the availability of financing for emerging eco economies may not disappear uh, because of the, the, the really consequences helpful. of this crisis. And, but the point that I was going to make is that my, you know, hunch is that 
investors have short memories. Mm -hmm. And although the down, you know, a ratings downgrade may limit a country's access to external financing in the short run, um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's curtains forever, particularly against the background where you've got this ugly contest where, you know, there are going to be a lot of, other, you know, a lot of developed countries suffering uh, much more dramatic deteriorations in their balance sheets. Now it's a real masterclass there and sort of thinking through all of the di different dimensions of that. Thank you. I wanted to bring us on to a little bit to the international cooperation around this because we've seen, I mean, it was vital getting us through the global financial crisis yeah. in the wake of the Lehman. Um, 2007, 8, 9, that whole period. Um, we've got these international institutions that have been set up, the IMF, the World Bank. Um, G20 was another important source of coordination. So can you just talk us through what we've seen on the international um, coordination front and whether it's what we need um, and what, what, what more we need, if you like, as well? Yeah. Um, when, as you ask that question, I can think of two kind of broad categories of, of answer. One is that I think I need to say something about the US-China relationship and the other is about the, the sort of multilateral institutions that, 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 you, that you raise. Um, I don't think it's any uh, big surprise to anyone. The US-China relationship is in a kind of state of collapse. Mm -hmm. um, that collapse obviously was not brought on by the coronavirus crisis. It was building, uh, uh, not only building since Donald Trump came to the White House, but building well before that. Um, uh, so this is a, a, a th this is a, a deterioration in the relationship between the world's two biggest economies uh, that uh, makes any other kind of international cooperation much less likely, and so the you know the the, the catastrophic state of the U.S.-China relationship I think is a kind of overarching bit of bad news <laughs> for for co for cooperation generally. Um, as far as the you know sort of global institutions are concerned. I mean, I I guess some of the bad news, or some of the additional bad news, comes from the fact that this U.S. White House uh, explicitly is not a fan of you know in, you know, the, the United Nations institutions. I mean, you know, the Trump is defunding the WHO, and um, the Trump administration's support for the I, for the IMF is constrained and the IMF uh, becomes a very important uh, kind of component of this puzzle because the IMF is the world's lender of last resort. So the question is in a crisis like this where debt burdens are exploding, where capital flows are constrained, um, where emerging market central banks are needing to reduce interest rates in order to satisfy you know, domestic objectives, you know, uh, 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 avoiding damaging domestic balance sheets, as I said, um, what role can these in international institutions play? The IMF is constrained by a couple of things. The, you know, the IMF's kind of headline statement throughout this crisis is, don't worry, we've got a trillion dollars to lend. A trillion dollars, a lot of money. But actually, it's not as good as it sounds for a couple of reasons. One is that of that $1 trillion, about $200 billion is, is stuff that the IMF has already committed to lend. So this is not, you know, that, the, that $1 trillion is including, you know, not all of that $1 trillion is kind of additional money. Mm. The more fundamental problem, as I see it, has to do with the traditional way in which the IMF lends money. The IMF's traditional way of lending money is, by, is, is relying on what's called conditionality. So, you know, the IMF goes to a country and says, you know, here's $15 billion, but in exchange for this $15 billion, you have to tighten your belt. And that belt tightening, which, you know, I'm really oversimplifying, uh, but, you know, not badly, that belt tightening um, partly has the, you know, partly is needed because a country, you know, when you go to your lender of last resort, you know, you go to the IMF because no one else wants to supply you with foreign exchange. So you go to the IMF that's, you know, happy to be the lend last resort lend supplier of foreign exchange. But because the, the reason why nobody else wants to supply you with foreign exchange might be because your need for foreign exchange is so big. So one of the effects of belt tightening, one of the reasons for belt tightening is to restrict the whole economy's need for foreign exchange. Mm 
um, which is a you know can be a completely reasonable thing to do. But the other another function that conditionality serves is that it acts as a kind of collateral for the IMF's own loans. So the IMF, you know, when the IMF lends $15 billion to a country, it doesn't take physical assets as collateral in the way that your bank takes your house as collateral when you, when you, when you take out a mortgage. Conditionality acts as a sort of collateral. In other words, by the, the leverage that the IMF has over a, a country's economic policy in exchange for its loans, help to ensure that the IMF is going to get repaid. And that's very important because the IMF, because it's the lender of last resort, it's got to make sure that it gets repaid. In other words, it's got to preserve what's called its senior creditor status. And, and taking or, or using conditionality as this form of collateral helps to maintain the IMF's ability to function as the lender of last resort. If the lender of last resort finds that nobody's going to repay it, then it's going to run out of its ability to be the lender of last resort. Um, and so it, this all makes sense under normal circumstances. But of course, these are not normal circumstances. They're not normal because this is a humanitarian crisis. And it would be absurd for a country to tighten its belt. You know, if, if the, so sort of reduce so the impetus in a way to say, come, you know, come and take a loan from the IMF. In return, you reduce your fiscal spending. But actually, right now, it's precisely the opposite is what countries Exactly, are exactly. So the IMF is stuck with a problem that either it, it forgets about conditionality, but doing that would create the risk that the, the ability of the IMF to get repaid might go down and that would sacrifice the IMF's role in the international financial system, or it stays on the sidelines. Mm. There's one kind of in-between thing. The in-between thing is that the IMF, within this $1 trillion, the IMF does have about $100 billion of what's called, or of what's properly emergency financing. In other words, it's not, uh, it's not linked to any conditionality. And there are two facilities. One is called the Rapid Credit Facility, which is for very poor countries. And one is called the Rapid Financing, one, the Rapid Financing Instrument, which is for everybody else. And this is genuine, genuine um, emergency finance. But the access, that countries have to those facilities is limited. So take a country like South Africa, for example, the, you know, South Africa would normally have access or could have access to the rapid financing instrument. But in year one, you can only get 100% of your quota at the IMF um, uh, uh, as a, a, a rapid financing instrument loan. For, for South Africa, that's for about $4 billion. It's not necessarily game-changing amounts of money. Uh, and so there is still a lot of question, uh, questioning that you can you know, pose about what role the IMF can really play in supporting this crisis. And as others have pointed out, in a way, the Fed and the liquidity that's being provided by the Fed is a huge amount of support. But again, there's not that many countries that they're getting swap lines, right? So it's not the developing countries, it's a bunch of the sort of right. larger economies. So in a way, that's not a solution. There's, there's a, a difference that I think is useful between an operational shortage of foreign exchange and a fundamental shortage of foreign exchange. If you've just got an operational shortage of dollars, in other words, you've got dollar assets or you've got a currency that is kind of trustworthy enough for the Fed to want to swap. So you can get dollars by giving the Fed either treasury bonds or your own currency, you know, in a country like Korea or Singapore, where the Fed is not, you know, not too unhappy about having Korean won or Singapore dollars. But most developing countries have, don't have operational shortages of foreign exchange. Uh, they have fundamental shortages of foreign exchange, and a swap line doesn't, doesn't solve that problem. Can I just um, take us on to the G20? And, yeah. sort of, and the questions are down around debt relief. So we've seen quite a lot of discussion now about um, removing both sort of debt payment moratorium so that governments don't have to service the the interest that they already should be servicing at the moment and in normal conditions, but also as we think about this new debt that's being racked up, how it, it's managed. So where's the G20 come into this and what are your thoughts about the efficacy of G20 cooperation? Okay. One, one important distinction before I start answering is the distinction between total public debt, 
a developing country's total public debt includes both debt denominated in its own currency and debt denominated in dollars or foreign exchange. Um, so there's, there's total public debt and then there's external debt, which is just, um, I mean, it's a bit of a Venn diagram, but the external debt can be the debt that a government owes in foreign exchange to foreign creditors, but it can also include debt that the private sector in that country owes to foreign creditors in foreign currencies. So just to clear that up, um, the G20 initiative is just dealing with public sector external debt. So, you know, sort of bit, that bit in the, inside the Venn diagram. Um, and what the G20 is proposing is for um, the, the, the world's very poorest countries, countries with per capita incomes below around $1,200 a year, um, that there should be a suspension of debt service for the second half of, of 2020. Um, it, it, it involves a group of just under 80 countries. Um, there are three problems that I can see. One is to do with China. One is to do with multilateral development banks. And one is to do with private sector creditors. So what the G20 said is, you know, we bilateral, we're going to, you know, forgive debt service. Um, and we want multilateral development banks like the Asian Development Bank or the African Development Bank or the Asian Infrastructure, uh, Asian, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the New Development Bank, all these development banks should be doing the same thing. And they've all, the G20 also asked private sector creditors to provide equivalent debt relief. The, so the first problem, the China problem is that although China is a signatory to the G20 statement, China's negotiations with debtor countries tend to be in a separate room. China is not a member of the Paris Club, which is the group of, uh, which is the group of well, rich, richish country governments as creditors. It's not, a, it's, it's never been a, a member of the Paris Club, and so it tends to conduct its debt negotiations with countries to whom it's lent money separately, and that means that there's a lot of uncertainty about what China will be doing with, uh, in its negotiations with, with, with developing countries that have borrowed from it. The second, the second problem with the multilateral development banks echoes what I was saying earlier about the IMF. Multilateral development banks like the World Bank and, and the regional development banks that I mentioned are also senior creditors in the international financial system. And the multilateral development banks are all kind of worried that if they provide debt relief to these countries, they will lose their uh, credit ratings and that will make it more expensive for them to borrow money. And so the whole system will become poorer as a result. So how multilateral, multilateral development banks are going to be involved in this G20 initiative, as far as I understand it today, is still unclear. And for sure, it's unclear how private sector creditors are going to be involved. Um, the, there's an institution in Washington called the IIF, the Institute for International Finance, which is a kind of, I guess, a sort of industrial association of, of, of global banks and, and global asset managers. The IIF kind of stepped up to try and coordinate um, private sector debt relief. Uh, to kind of match what, what the G20 was doing and in, and in response to the G20's request. But um, the IIF's ability to, uh, to, to fulfill that role is constrained because nobody is, you know, this is all basically um, use of the word please. It's a kind um, of voluntary you know, initiative. Uh, you know, private sector creditors are are being asked, you know, please, can you can you uh, provide debt relief alongside the G20's bilateral the incentives debt? then for a private sector to provide any debt relief? Is there any sort of self-interest or is this entirely a, an appeal to their altruism? Um, there's absolutely no self-interest at all. Mm. Um, and it's not, I mean, that, that's one, I mean, that's that that's exactly the overall problem. Does that, you know, you're, you're asking a bunch of people to kind of willingly lose money and no one will want to willingly lose, lose money. That's complicated by a couple of other um, problems. Let's say you're a, 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 an asset manager and you've bought South Africa, uh, 
Angolan bonds or, uh, or Zambian bonds. Your, your ownership of those bonds is not so much for yourself. You are investing other people's money. And that creates what asset managers or, and financial institutions describe as a fiduciary duty. And so one of the constraints on, on bondholders' ability to say, yeah, sure, you know, we think that the, you know, the right thing to do is to provide debt relief to these countries. Um, you know, one, one obstacle that they face, this is a genuine obstacle, is that they promised to the people whose money they're looking after to look after it in as you know, responsible a way as possible. And although, in other words, that to, to make sure that the people whose money that they're investing get their money back. Right. So really thinking about what's that response, what's the nature of that responsibility? Because if it's yes. holding and preserving that financial asset, yeah. I mean, in a way, any sort of find that if there's any sort of humanitarian use of that asset that's provided for in that contractual yeah. arrangement or not. Yeah, I mean, in theory, you know, so in a way, what I'm describing is a situation where the asset manager is a kind of agent, not a principal. Absolutely. And so one, in theory, one way of breaking through that, that obstacle is that you find some way of getting the principles, i.e. the people whose money the asset managers are investing by buying Zambian bonds or Angolan bonds, you get them to say, yeah, go ahead. But presumably they need, everybody's got to... Yeah, so, it, so the, and then the, the, the coordination problems yeah. and the sort of logistical difficulties become extremely, extremely... Um, and just to be clear, I mean, why this is important is because actually the private sector holds a lot of developing country debt now. Right? Yes. So they've become a big player in this. It's not that the majority of debt is owed to public sector. And no, that's, yeah, that, that's true. That's true. Although, you know, the, the thing that I think there's an important distinction to make between very poor countries, i.e. the countries that are the recipients of, of the G20 initiative and other emerging economies, I mean, emerging Emerging markets is such a, an absurdly broad term. It's it's a term that that is almost meaningless. Um, I mean, just to give you a kind of local example of how absurd it is, the economist who is responsible for the analysis of Zambia works for me as head of emerging markets economics, but the economist that is responsible for uh, for researching Singapore also wow. works for me <laughs> so it, you know the, it, it's a the term emerging markets is a kind of actual for most of the world by this yeah basically basically um and so th its analytical value is is really very low so you know it's often important to kind of you know set up lots of little subgroups within this yeah. broad ridiculous and really think about how they're all differentially yes. situated in the financial system and i think you know i think the the case the case for debt relief for the 80 or so countries that are recipients of, of IDA uh, lending is, in other words, the very poor countries, is vastly different to the case for, you know, other countries that you would describe as developing countries like, you know, Mexico or Indonesia or... Middle-income countries as opposed to the real sort of lower-income ones. Yeah. Brilliant. So that was a fascinating discussion there, Dave. Thank you very much. Just wanted to ask just a couple of things about the sort of prognosis. So obviously debt workout and debt relief is going to be one of the things that's high up on the agenda. Anything else we should have a watch out for and be looking out for in this space as, as this pandemic plays out? And just final lessons and thoughts and reflections from you. I think, I mean, I, I tend to be pessimistic as a person. Um, and I, I think there are a bunch of quite pessimistic questions to, to ask oneself. Uh, about the kind of global environment that developing countries are going to be facing on the other side of this. Developing countries' growth was kind of supported over the last 30 years by aspects of globalization that seem to be under threat now, and not just because of coronavirus, but you know, predating it. The aspects of globalization that I'm thinking about are the value of trade liberalization, in other words, the ability that you can the, the, the support to your growth that comes from reducing trade barriers and enjoying higher rates of export growth. Um, and the simultaneously connected to that, the um, willingness and, and desire of firms to disaggregate their supply chains internationally. So the, the, the core 
bit of globalization that was so helpful, I think, to many developing countries' growth in the last couple of decades was that was the sort of deal where, not a deal, but a, a coincidence where trade barriers come down. And as trade barriers come down, long-term capital, FDI, comes in. Um, so that, that sort of nugget, that core of the globalization story over the last 30 years that I think had a lot of benefit for developing countries is really threatened. It's been threatened for several years now, partly because global protectionism has been a phenomenon becoming more and more visible since 2012, 2013. Um, and now also because the coronavirus crisis seems to have triggered uh, a rise in economic nationalism um, that uh, not only makes uh, international coordination much more difficult, going back to the point that we were discussing earlier about the US-China relationship, um, but also means that the global, the globalized economic framework, the sort of norm that existed within the international order, that trade liberalization and, and a global expansion of supply chains was generally helpful to everyone, that norm has been weakened by this crisis. And, and so I think the economic environment that developing countries face on the other side of this is really, really uncertain. And tough by the sounds of it. Yeah. David, thank you very much for this conversation. It's Pleasure. been a really fascinating one and a real tour of all the complexities and importance of the global financial system at the moment and how it's playing out around the world. So much, much appreciated. My pleasure. Take care.